It's the Dearly Departed Podcast, featuring your host, historian Scott Michaels, and filmmaker Mike Dorsey. Okay, Scott, we're doing it. We made it past the uh, the 27 Club. We're at episode 28. We did it. Yay. <laughs> and they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> I probably said that every time you said that, too. <laughs> and and now we're going to die in a towering inferno because uh, that is the subject of this uh, episode 28 is the towering inferno from 1974. I Yeah, I was I was a huge fan of disaster movies loved it and uh and i thought when we were talking about subject matter uh, we, because of the uh i don't know what is it it's like an inferno out there because it was 123 <laughs> last week i just figured oh that, that's desert. actually i'm in the mood for this now i'm in the mood for this so <laughs> so uh yeah but i had i was I, I, a little while ago i was going through some old papers my old scrapbook and I happened to find, uh, I used to collect movie ads. I used to literally cut out movie ads and paste them in my scrapbook. I don't know why. It was just such a weird thing to do, but I did. And uh, this movies I really liked. And, of course, I like the disaster movies. There's Earthquake, and I like Young Frankenstein. But there's The Towering Inferno. And, uh, and I wanted to read just the, the first paragraph of this review that I clipped. It was a, a magazine called The Scholastic Voice, whatever that means. And it says, never find your delight in another's misfortune, wrote a wise Roman named Publilius Pub, Pubilius Cirrus. But Publilius <laughs> lived before disaster movies, which delight us by turning catastrophe into entertainment. If he were alive today, he would probably be lining up with the rest of us to enjoy the latest fun flick with its all-star, all-star cast embroiled in some super cataclysm. And which, Jeez. good. This pretty much defines my career, really. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I love uh, Gene Siskel wrote um, our attitude toward the film's cardboard characters is let them burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm there on a lot of cases. You know, this a lot of these people. I would say that you know this movie. There's a lot of scenery being chewed up in this movie. There's a lot of of mm-hmm. just insane over the top acting and uh and and but we'll get into all those in a little yeah. bit but this movie when it came out i mean it was you know your typical 90 minutes was a movie back then and this one was two hours and almost two hours and 45 minutes of movie and that's a hell of a time for something that's like this ash action-packed drama that it really appeals to a younger audience you know i mean mm-hmm. I, like people in their teens and and like me at that point and it was just that's a long time to sit and watch a movie it's not a fast-paced movie not a fast-paced movie at all it's a towering running time you might say there you are. Yes. <laughs> they burned they burned a lot of film filming it. And and yes, they did. And I think 25 people uh in the movie died of burns uh mm-hmm. cast members and the cast they said it was a cast of 3000 people were in this movie what? extras etc. That's what, that's what I read. And they used 57 hmm. sets. They built 57 sets for this movie, which is insane. Wow. Uh I think they spent 11 million making it and uh and it was an interesting way that 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 uh, uh, that he got it made, Irwin Allen. I mean, you probably did you did yeah. you? It's fascinating. I did, I did, and I'm I'm tempted. I, I was gonna. I, I, I was. Let's go into news first. Oh, news oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, we're getting distra- absolutely. I get it. <laughs> we're getting distracted. I forget, about, I forget we do that. Um, I do. I do. We <laughs> um, we have news and we have we have hate mail. We have some hate mail. Well. We have a little bit of hate mail. Yeah. Just, let's, uh, let's hear the hate mail. Hate mail. All right. So the ones that I saved, and I, I saved disappointedly few, because uh, the one somebody said about our Jaws podcast, um, dumb. <laughs> and uh, and uh, <laughs> that this, <laughs> well, they did point out that the, our podcast was longer than the movie itself, which is kind of funny. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> this one was about this one was about something we did together that the uh, uh the James Dean Donald Termaseed video that we did 
that uh, where we, we which, retrace the steps of James Dean's last drive out to the crash yeah, station. Yeah. Yeah. And this guy says, uh, thanks for the totally, completely uninspiring video. Every time, <laughs> every detail I was hoping you would cover was ignored. How unprofessional, how amateurish, how juvenile. What a waste of my time. <laughs> when I could have been doing something really stimulating, like watching paint dry. <laughs> it's like, all right. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm going to post an actual video of paint drying and tag that guy. You know, we should, we actually, that'd be a, that'd be a good third sort of box on our, on our podcast is simultaneously <laughs> having, having paint dry. You, can, you have your, you have an option. <laughs> That's hilarious. Now the other, the other ones, you know, I haven't gotten too many. The, the long video one was kind of funny and this one was kind of funny too. The other ones. I, you know, I get well, people send me gifts in the mail. Well, I get a lot of really odd sort sure. of packages in the mail, and and I save them up and I open them up on a video, and and there's all kinds of you know. Last time I opened it up, someone sent me a, a dress that was owned by Anne Bancroft, and the uh, that's the cool. one I, I just I, yeah, it was very cool. I mean, these things, you know, really original autographs people send me. I I, I did one the other day wow. that I'm going to post at some point this week. Uh, stuff that they have in their collections that, you know, what am I going to do with this? And they they send them to me. <laughs> and it's so nice and so kind. So I do these on video. And what you see is my hands mm -hmm. opening the video. Well, somebody wrote, you should <laughs> you should lather that beautifully tatted arm with cocoa butter before each use. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's giving you skin tips, man. Skin care. That's I know, important. you know, it's just that... that lather it up in fact lather it while we're watching and, um, and this one <laughs> slowly <laughs> i gotta i we probably shouldn't even use this one but i'm gonna read this this is a real postcard somebody sent me uh, <laughs> i just wanted to say thank you for all you do i love you for your honesty you're like the only person that i would save in a fire um speaking uh, of inferno wish you i wish you were here meaning this hotel del coronado I swear to God, I'd show my appreciation. I'd suck you off because you mean so much. <laughs> well, all right. There you are. <laughs> we at that. <laughs> you're, you're like, uh, the Coronado, how long are you going to be there? <laughs> it's just, I, I just, you know, I, I would save you in a fire and I'd suck you off because you mean so much. There you are. <laughs> and uh, and with that, the towering inferno, folks. <laughs> um, is that the end of the hate mail? Yes, it is. I I I will be more <laughs> more careful about saving them next time. But yeah, yes. yeah, that's um, it. Uh, there's a little bit of news. News of the week. <laughs> uh, my movie Lost Airman of Buchenwald, my documentary that I spent the Corona times updating. Uh, just got released by uh, Freestyle Digital Media, and it is out on uh, iTunes and um, all the digital download, all the places you can digital rent things digitally and download them, except Amazon, unfortunately, because Amazon is clamped down on documentary distribution. Um, but it's everywhere, and it's on pay per view, like eighty percent of the cable and satellite carriers. It's on there. So, uh, Lost Airman of Buchenwald. It's a historical documentary about my grandfather who was a, a B-26 pilot who ended up in the Buchenwald concentration camp. Um, it was a very bizarre and unusual story. So it's all about the, him and his the group he was with, how they got through all that. So It is a, a, an amazing it documentary. Out. I love that documentary. Thank very you. Very much so. No, it's it's yeah. uh, it's a, It means a lot that people get the, the attention they deserve for the things they did for us. And uh, they, right. you know, a lot of people fell by the wayside. And a lot of people that were involved in, in wars back then – didn't talk about it you know i had i had relatives Almost that i know were in germany and they it was just we we don't talk about that and it, it i you just that makes it even more mysterious like what do they do you know um that is almost like a universal theme that you always hear from the veterans especially world war ii is they do not they don't talk about or they talk about it a little bit but not you know you don't get the whole story kind of a deal yeah, yeah. Now, if it wasn't for your documentary, and uh, you wouldn't know the details of it, and those details shouldn't die with the right. people that, uh, you know, they should. People should know what happened. So I, I no, I think it's a fascinating documentary. I love it, and I'm glad you did it. Uh, thank you. I, I think some of, several of the men that were in it, uh, all eight men that are in it, have passed away since I filmed it because I started, you know, first originally filmed it like started ten years ago. 
All right. So, uh, the towering inferno. It's time for the main feature. It's time for the main feature. Uh, Towering Inferno, the 1974 disaster film by Irwin Allen, who um, we did his uh, movie he did two years previously, The Poseidon Adventure. And I see I see this as being like The Poseidon Adventure if the ship was like vertical, <laughs> basically, right? It's, it's just it a is. similar plot, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so many similar scenarios, similar characters, similar music. Now, it's, it is very, uh, it's very, let's go with it. You know, it's working. Let's go with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's uh, uh, um, it, it, a giant ens- ensemble cast of stars and lots of people die and, you know, what stars are going to die and all that stuff. And, um, um, yeah. The thing that's really stood out. Well, first, yeah, there's a, there's the spoiler alert. A lot of people die. If you haven't seen this movie yet, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people that die. But I'm going to say one of the most shocking things about this movie because technically the special effects were good. There's only a couple of scenes that were like, you know, but I think considering the time they did this, they, sure. they, they really did outstanding work. And um, uh, I, it just seems like the characters hold up for the most part. A lot, you know, there's a lot of overacting, but uh, a lot of scenery chewing. <laughs> but one of the things I never really understood about this movie is that the hair, the hair was so bad i've never seen so many bad toupees and bad wigs on people than in this movie it's shocking it's like acrylic people are wearing acrylic <laughs> and uh, it is just it's unbelievable it's just hair piece upon hair piece upon hair piece and they there's like three people in the credits they get credit for hair and that's what they came <laughs> up with <laughs> you know, i just figured it's, it's i just thought it's 1974 hair is yeah bad. i don't know no, that was bad hair pieces though. <laughs> that was contrived. Chris. Somebody those were those were designed to look that way. <laughs> Somebody did screen tests with the hair and was like, Yeah, go with yeah. that. Right. Mm-mm. And that would have burned up in a fire. I'm surprised like with the flames they weren't just like <laughs> curling up because of the you know, it just because it was just <laughs> synthetic and it was so awful. Right. But but that's part of the fun of it now in retrospect. But very little of the movie is is you know, it's really laughable. There are a few laughable scenes because they're so hokey and so so long ago and campy. But but a lot mm. of this movie holds up well. And uh, yeah, and I think I well, do you know the story about how it how it how it came to fruition? This movie. Yeah. So they uh, there were two books that were coming out about a towering inferno. They had two different titles, and Warner Brothers and Fox both each went out and and got the rights to each of them. So they were going to be two competing movies about to- uh, high rise buildings on fire. And that's when Irwin Allen, who was at Fox, convinced Warner Brothers and Fox to combine forces and just make one. So not, look, let's not cannibalize each other's sales by putting out two movies at the same time on the same subject. And what's, yeah. and I didn't realize that's what they did, but I remember in the opening credits, they credit two books as the source material. And that was my tip off of like, well, that's very unusual. It's usually just yeah. one book. Um, and that's, that's what yeah. it was. And, and, and the different studios took different rights to get their money back and they went in, you know, even Stevens on the budget and there it is. Yeah. I heard that Alan, Alan was bidding on the tower and the glass inferno. The other one wasn't published yet. So Alan lost mm-hmm. the, lost the tower to Warner, but he bought the glass inferno and brought it to Fox and went to Warner and said, look, yeah, let's not, this would be stupid. Let's combine. So I just like the first two studio production. I don't know if that's in history, but I know their yes. logos don't show up at the beginning of the movie. You don't see the Warner mm-hmm. Brothers and the Fox logos. They're, they don't show up. So it's interesting. That's a real, I don't know if that, how often that happens in life. That's kind of interesting. And he's basically saying, look, let's not both out put, let's not put out two movies that will lose money because they're the same. I, someone, yeah. All of a sudden I hear someone trying to open my door and I look out and it's just like three year old. <laughs> Uh-huh. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to fight Except somebody. No, I'm gonna go. Oh. And... Right, exactly. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a setup. Um, it's uh, basically Irwin Allen, who's you know his nickname was the Master of Disaster. His thing was basically we can either both make the same film and they won't make money. They'll both lose money because we're gonna eat each other's sales, or you yeah. can go in on one film and and everybody makes money. So their first run was a year. 
on that movie. You know, they, it ran for a year first run and that's crazy. It's, it's amazing that they used to do that. Yeah. 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 And it, it's amazing because this movie is not like a classic, you know, it's it, of the disaster movies, you think earthquake, sure. you think, but towering Inferno, it doesn't get a whole lot of references. You can't quote lines. In fact, I couldn't tell you who was in it except for the two stars. And there's a lot of right. people in this movie. So um, it's it's a weird movie that fell to the wayside. Was very successful when it came out, but uh, not really not really referred to very. It doesn't have that cult status as the others, right? And to people who haven't seen it, the 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 plot line is that this place called Glass Tower is the tallest building in the world. It's 138 stories. It's um, which is funny because it's in San Francisco where they have lots of earthquakes, um, and uh, and and it's the 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 it takes place on the opening night, the grand opening night when they're having this huge opening night party up on like or one of the high floors, and it turns out that the developer's crooked son-in-law, who was the electrical subcontractor used shoddy materials for the all the electrical wiring and so when they turn all the lights on on the tower for the big opening night to show off how you know awesome the building looks it fries all the electric cables in the building and and starts the the inferno um that then spreads and it's all about the firefighters and the people inside trying to uh, survive and get out of it yeah i mean the 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 party took place on the 135th floor that's the what the movie, right the fire took, was actually started on the 81st floor. So a yeah. lot of the movie was like, oh, it's not going to make it up here. And, and, mm. and um, you know, it was interesting because a lot of this movie really got me thinking about, you know, the World Trade Center. Uh, you know, right. it was when those explosions happened, it was like, this is weird because it, it really it it was like instantaneous. Now. I think it was like right. guttural. It's like, wow, this is like just and, like the World Trade Center. And there's lots of people falling. A lot of people fall to their deaths yeah. from the window. Several, ca- you know, ca- big characters fall fall off. So yeah, it's it's a little. It's, and that's it's, also it's some, just you know, something that's interesting because at the time they made this movie, the World Trade Center was the biggest, tallest building in the world. They wrapped filming on September 11th, 1973. What? And three months after, there was a fire in the real World Trade Center where 16 people were injured, burned, not oh. killed. But it's just, it right. was like, I, I was I was watching this in a documentary. It was made back in 90, I think it was 95 or 2005. It must have been, there was, yeah, there, well, no, there was no reference to September 11th. So I think it was, I think it was 95 that this came out, this documentary that I watched was just like, but it was, um, yeah, it was really, it's even more bizarre when you think of it that, that way. One thing uh, stood out to me too, and I don't know if this was explained in the plot or they just didn't put it in there, but even when like entire floors are on fire, there's no alarm going off. Was the alarm system fried or did they just not have it? Well, OJ because... Simpson was part of that. And he, he they said, why yeah. at the beginning when it happened, why wasn't the fire department notified? And I don't know was the answer. Uh, <laughs> you know, we don't, <laughs> That's great. that was it. I mean, that was, it was why is there a plot hole? Like, well, we don't know. Honest. We don't know. <laughs> you know, something screwed up. Because there's one scene, you know, where the kind of the, the, the couple, the PR man, I think, and, and the woman are kind of hooking up and they don't realize the whole building is on fire and they die because of it. And it's like entire floors are on fire. How are the alarms not going off? But I guess yeah, I, I, maybe it has something to do with that control yeah, yeah. center that OJ was in. I don't know. Because he was going door to door, knocking on doors. Well, because mm-hmm. half of the building wasn't even occupied yet. Because remember the beginning of the movie, the real estate guy right. was showing, you know, 80, 80 floors to the top is residential. So there was right. probably little occupation. And since he was involved with the building of the place, maybe he was like one of the only apartments, yeah. maybe. But, and uh, I can't remember, does, does OJ make it? Does he survive? Because yeah. okay. he saves the cat. I remember. <laughs> and, he, and he gives it to Fred Astaire at the end. That's but, right. And Fred Astaire lo- loses his special lady friend. All the people that die in this movie are the people that deserve to die. You know, it's one of those moral movies, like the people having the affair, the people that cheated, the people that were slimy. You know, they were, most of the people that died in this movie were people that deserved to die in that in that yeah. regard. They were not likable people. Yeah, except for the uh, the woman that um, Astaire was oh, trying to con. Remember L- Liza Lett or Liza Lett, what was, her, what was her name? And did you Lisa do you watch Lett, how she? I think, yeah. she, I think she, yeah. she falls out of the elevator, right? The outdoor <laughs> elevator. And if you, you watch elevator, like the yeah. dummy. The dummy hit yeah, the the balcony yeah. and go like spinning so <laughs> it was fast. Really bad, yeah, 
<laughs> that's one like, of the embarrassing moments. It was disturbing. It was a little disturbing. It was like, whoa. I can't believe they left that in there. <laughs> it was really bad. I mean, it was really so cheesy when they happened. I mean, the original, the built, the model that they built was impressive. It was like 60 or 70 feet tall. So they made yeah. a proper good model. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, that that little dummy <laughs> doing that. It was literally like a pow. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of funny. Like, uh, but that was a yeah, surprise. Guess, that was a surprise to me when that happened. I guess they had to make, well, they had to make the model big because they had to make the fire look not hokey when they're showing the, you know, the floors on fire. I guess it make, that's what, that stood out to me. I was like, oh, they used a pretty big model to make the fire yeah. look. Yeah. And it you was know, really dramatic when, totally they, fake, when they lit yeah. it for the first time and it was like, boom, boom, every, you know, every right. quarter of it. That was really cool. They mm -hmm. did a good job with that. Um. Oh, and again, another John Williams score who also scored Earthquake that came out the same year. Mm -hmm. And Star Wars um, and Lost and, in Space and Valley of the Dolls. And it's just so weird. And uh, the Morning After song in Poseidon Adventure won the Oscar for Best Original Song. And then We May Never Lo Love Like This Again in The Towering Inferno won the Oscar for that one. So Irwin Ir Allen had back-to-back -back disaster movies win Oscars for Best Original Song. Same songwriters, same singer. Yep. <laughs> and they Isn't sound the same alike. Singer? Yeah. And she's yeah, in it. Yeah, Maureen McGovern. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's it's funny because you it's like there's a moment where they're in that ballroom, the promenade room or whatever it's called, and uh, and it's very similar to the to the main ballroom of the Poseidon Adventure. There's a band in the same right. place. There's a woman up there singing a song <laughs> that sounds just like there's got to be a morning after. And then I realized later right. on that it was the same songwriters and the same singer. And that, I had to look it up what they were up against for that year when they won. And it was like, it was the theme from Benji, uh, Blazing Saddles. <laughs> the, there's a song in the movie Blazing Saddles, something called The Little Prince. And there was a movie called Gold and the song was Wherever Love Takes Me. So I don't, the, the other songs were, none of the songs are memorable. So whoever right. has that Oscar should be very happy uh, um, of that. I mean, look, most Oscar-nominated songs are not a, the, the cream of the crop of the music world. Let's just be honest. Yeah. Most That's years, true. So. There's usually yeah. like one or two that you've actually heard of, and the rest you're, uh, <laughs> you know because they got nominated but there was for a, there, there was a couple of very, very Star Wars moments in this movie in the sound. You know, when they were at the, the end, the really suspenseful end, it was, uh, you know, I, I noticed it. Aside from the John Williams connection, I mm -hmm. just noticed the similarity to Star Wars, and then I realized, oh, yeah, it's him. So it, it, yep. there was definitely a, a similarity in styles, and it was only a couple of years later. So, And he did Earthquake, too. I forgot about that. I didn't know that. Yeah, which was the same year. Hmm. So it's, uh, he was busy, busy doing disaster score, music scores, I guess. You know. Have you watched Earthquake lately? I have not watched it since I was a kid. Because there's so many cool Hollywood scenes in Earthquake, the Capitol Records building and, and the Hollywood sign and, and uh, the, the, um, the Hollywood Dam and, and that office building, the figure is in quite a bit. And there's also very similar scenes in that movie, Earthquake, to this movie. Because there's a point where they're, you know, how in this movie, how they're, they're from one office to, from the top of the building and they're propelling them in a chair uh, you know, to the other rooftop. Uh, you know what I'm talking uh, about? I don't remember. In, 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 the, in the Towering Inferno, when they're trying to oh, rescue okay. the people, and they attach a chair to the top of that building, and they fling them across yes. to the next office building to save them. Well, there's a really long scene in Earthquake where they, they get whim, a woman on a desk chair and a fire hose, and they wrap the fire hose on the desk chair and are lower. It's very similar. And also the twisting staircase which also has similarities to uh, to the Poseidon Adventure when they're crawling up the Christmas tree. There's a point where the earthquake hits and you've got the railings that are dangling there and he's and he's climbing down the railings. It's like the Christmas tree and it's like earthquake. It's just you know they just talk about cannibalizing. You know that's what that's so what he did. In in earthquake, the the dam at the Hollywood Reservoir breaks. Is that the one that breaks? Yeah. yeah. Poor Mulholland, man. There's a there's a plaque there for Mulholland. Yep. So the no guy kidding. that did the St. Francis Dam, which is the biggest man-made disaster in California state history, he's in, he, he's like in the afterlife going, really? Really? You had to be another one of my dams. He blew up in the damn movie. Like, really? Just can't get away from it. Oh, uh, that's sad. Wow. 
It's, it's so funny. I'm looking at this earthquake thing. It's it's it's, it's on you know on screens for the twelfth trembling week because that was sense around <laughs> too. That was crazy. Sense around was amazing. Uh, where they you know they had those bass speakers in the cam in the in the old theaters and the whole place shook. They were just popping up the the bass and. And mm-hmm. it was screwing up the old theaters. Like the the old theaters were literally falling apart because they couldn't handle <laughs> the vibrations inside. And uh, and I remember when they broadcast it on television, they they did a broadcast on FM radio. So you crank up your it's a, there would be a little flash to turn on your your radio loud, and it would it, they're broadcasting basically sense around so you could watch it on TV. That was uh, mm. that's kind of funny, but anyway. I love that kind of shit. I love hokey <laughs> movies. I love, I love, you know, the Tingler with, you know, where they rig the seats. And I remember seeing a creature feature when I was a kid where the, during the, during the break between the double features, they were doing a spiral on the screen and say, look out, look out, here come the monsters. And these guys in costumes are come running out and run up and down uh, the hall, uh, up down the aisles and stuff. And I love awesome. that kind of stuff, that hokey, um, uh, who's the guy that the producer, William Castle. He used to do a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, the director loved that. Loved that. So anyway, not involved with the Towering Inferno at all. I just went off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Steve McQueen and Paul Newman were the the headlining stars, um, which is an interesting combo because they were always kind of professional, uh, you know, um, opponents. I guess uh, they were both yeah, huge rivals. stars, the huge stars of their day, and um, and it, it, in, in which is evident in the how they're in the titles. There was a mm-hmm. debate over because they I, I did not know this, but apparently uh, Paul Newman originally wanted McQueen for uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And the reason McQueen didn't do it is because they never got they never settled the dispute over how the who would who would be the, the top build actor in it. So interesting. To, to, so to settle the issue with this one and I noticed immediately in the credits and then read it um, is they have. Uh, McQueen is listed first if you're looking left to right, but Newman's is higher. So they're like diagonally positioned. So you could argue on one hand, McQueen's is the first name you read reading left to right, but Paul Newman's name is higher on the screen. So they staggered yeah. them that way so that the, no one is really the first build, right? Um, it's kind of funny how they, they did that to satisfy It is interesting. I didn't know does. that about the Butch Cassidy thing because it would have been odd too because they both are these like – you know, monstrous blue eyes. I mean, and I don't mean that negatively. I mean, they, they both they're very similar blue looking eyes. in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. They're similar types of guys. Yeah. yeah. And I guess in this, in the case of, I guess McQueen was offered the role of the architect first and then wanted to go with the fire chief because the fire chief had more of a dramatic lines, you know, dramatic, uh, more of an impression he thought it would make. Yeah, um, he also gets more. A- he's he's better, I think. That I wouldn't. Have, I don't think I would have liked it as much if they were flipped because he gets more action no. stuff. And McQueen, for me, is more of an action guy. He's a, you know, even though they're yeah. very similar off off screen, they were both race car drivers and stuff. Steve McQueen was a little bit more, I think, rough and ragged. Uh, he they did they both did a number of their stuff. own stunts to the chagrin yeah. of the studios because they both got <laughs> injured during this during the shoot too. But I, I guess there was the there there was a it didn't seem like there was a unfriendly rivalry because they saw mm-hmm. I've seen outtakes and they're like laughing it up with each other. Sure. So I think it was in a, a more of an imagined or created uh, uh, rivalry. But they were both similar in appearance, so you could see how that happened. But oddly, because McQueen chose the chose the role of supposedly, as I as I understand it, chose the role of the fire chief, but he doesn't show up until like forty five minutes into the movie. You know, it's like right. it's like Newman's movie, but it's at forty three minutes and McQueen shows up. So, <laughs> but it's but sort of he weird. Still, then he still gets, but it's a two hour and forty four minute movie, so he still gets two hours. <laughs> yeah, so and they demanded contractually the that they that they have the same amount of lines. They have the exact same amount of lines that was there. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, but they looked. They said they looked like to be had a good time. So with Paul Newman, um, I've talked about this person uh, in the past, but uh, Jim Markham, who was Jay Sebring's protege and briefly mm-hmm. took over Sebring's business after Sebring was murdered and, um, and, and came out to L.A. and kind of at least tried to pick up where Sebring left off, left off with the celebrity clients and stuff. Uh, his name is Jim Markham, and he became uh, good friends with Paul Newman. And Paul Newman championed him and used him as his hairstylist for years. Uh, even he ended up even started getting credits on Paul Newman movies 
as the hairstylist hmm. on the on set because nice. Newman would fly him out. Um, and he would go to New York and, and give Paul Newman, you know, haircuts in his in his penthouse or whatever in New York City. And, uh, and I think he, he may have even been credited on The Sting, I think. Um, I know he did Newman's hair on The Sting. So, and Markham wrote a book um, like a couple years ago called Big Lucky about his life. And it goes into all, all of this. It's, it's, a, it's a good read, I think. Um, so I, I'm, I'm plugging it because it's an, an interesting read. Um, and also Paul Newman's son played a firefighter in the movie. He's the guy that I heard that, but I, wanna, I don't remember this. He, I don't remember he doesn't want to. He's the one that's afraid to rappel down the elevator shaft. As apparently Paul Newman's son. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So well, you, you know, Newman, by most accounts, is a really decent guy. You know, he he yep. he, he he continues to give to charity with his spaghetti sauce. He, you know, he willed it completely <laughs> to charity I, when he died. It was. It, um, I still I buy the what, Newman's own balsamic vinaigrette. It's a very good vinaigrette. Who does it benefit? Do you know? I don't. I have no idea. I just I buy it because I like it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but no he's idea. a decent guy. A decent guy. Um. So Paul Newman. I mean, we could spend hours just talking about his career. Uh, he plays the architect, who um, whose plan who, who I, somehow apparently doesn't know that the building he designed was very shoddily built, and you know goes up like a Roman candle, <clears throat> but then you know becomes a hero along with Steve McQueen because he's like. Paul Newman's kind of the, the cerebral one who knows how the building is designed, and McQueen's more of the kind of brash action hero uh, who comes in and yeah. does, you know. Um, but not and, over macho. That's what I liked about it. Mm. They weren't overacting. You know, they was McQueen wasn't doing that. Uh, he wasn't overacting. They were both really likable, pleasant mm -hmm. to watch people. And I, I don't right. – wasn't there was no one playing tough guy. There was right. no, no – it was, it was really – enjoyable to watch those two i was surprised at how enjoyable it was to watch those two because some of the others were unwatchable but it was down to you know i mean newman it wasn't his fault it was richard chamberlain's fault the the builder's son because the builder's right. son was the electrical engineer so it newman you know he that was he kind of, yeah he was pissed because his plans weren't you know, everything's up to code. He goes, well, this building is not code. You know, this is different code. And, and <laughs> Sure, sure. I <laughs> yeah, designed it to be better than code kind of deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah, because of the power it would have taken. But uh, so yeah. um, <laughs> it's so funny. Sorry. It's not funny, so, really, uh, <laughs> so Paul Newman passed away on September 26, 2008. Uh, he was 83 and he, he died from lung cancer. And, uh, yeah, he seemed like a really likable guy. There was a great episode of Iconoclast, I think, on Sundance TV with him and Redford kind of getting yeah. back together. And it seems like it wasn't long before Newman passed away, maybe within a few years of his death that, that, that they shot that. It's really interesting, and it shows how uh, Paul Newman had fixed up um, an old uh, um, playhouse, and he just seemed like a genuinely good dude, you know, and had one of the famously long-lasting marriages of Hollywood. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and didn't I, I? You know, there's never anything that's been, yeah, really published about him to being a dick. You know, right. he's he's just supposed to be a, a decent guy that most everyone enjoyed working with. That worked with, yeah. who worked with him. So, and, and they got, they, you know, that was the other thing. They both got, uh, they both got a million each, equal mm -hmm. billing, equal lines, and they both got a percentage of the gross. Oof. So uh, I don't know what that turned out to be, but it can't have hurt. Well, I mean, interestingly, Steve McQueen, the year that movie came out, became the highest paid actor in Hollywood and then disappeared for like four years and just went and, and traveled around the country and raced cars and motorcycles. And um, I almost wonder if he just was making so much money. He's like, yeah, hey, I don't got to do this acting thing for a while. I'm going to take my towering inferno residuals and whatever else he got and just go have fun. Um, yeah, there was, and that was the peak of that scandal with you know Ali McGraw and Robert Evans, and because mm -hmm. uh, he was he was married to Ali McGraw, who left Robert Evans for him. Right. And Evans was always, you know, we we read the same book, or he was like, well, I don't blame her for leaving me because I was too tied up. I promised her I'd never spend a week, uh, you know, a night away from home, and and he was away right. from home all the time. It's a great section in that movie. The kid stays in the picture too. Is his yeah. That whole segment about losing Alan McGraw. He's like, I'm losing Alan McGraw to like the best looking guy in the country or in the world or something like that. You know, the biggest star in yeah. the world. You know, what can I do? 
kind of deal. Yeah. And you hear Evans going, "That son of a bitch." <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was, I love right. the way he talks. <laughs> yeah. Right. Luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> 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 yeah. But he uh, also there's an outtake where it show it says Steve McQueen uh, in a, in an action sequence, and there was a cut, and he turns to the camera, a cutaway, and he just says, "If anything happens to me, Allie gets my pickup truck." <laughs> so just, you know, so they were uh, yeah. an odd, an interesting reference, personal speaking reference. Speaking of speaking of pickups, I really wanted to talk about this. Uh, Steve McQueen, of course, was super famous for his cars. Uh, he mm-hmm. loved to race cars. He raced motorcycles uh, when he was first trying to be an actor in New York. That's how he supported himself in large part um, by doing <clears throat> motorcycle races. And so, uh, if you know cars at all, any car that was owned by Steve McQueen is worth multiples more. Uh, than it normally would be on its own, but the fact that it was a McQueen vehicle is, you know, is pri- makes it prized. And uh, he even had a, um, he even had, I think it was last year, he, a 1952 camper truck, just the most boring, not a race car thing you can imagine, uh, sold for a hundred hundred thousand dollars for wow. this this old 52 truck. Um, his Ford GT uh, race car. Uh, sold in 2012 for 11 million dollars. At the time, it was the most expensive American car ever sold. Again, I mean, Ford GTs are worth a lot of money, but the fact that his that one was owned by McQueen made it worth even more. And then um, the Peterson has what I consider to be the ultimate sports car ever made. If you're a collector, they have his Jaguar XKSS, which, first of all, is one of the rarest cars to begin with because the factory burned down. And they oh, only yeah. built they only built sixteen of them. The factory burned down. Nine of them burned up in the factory. So there were only one only seven of them made of the original run. Steve McQueen then owned one of them. Uh, he called it, I think, the Green Rat or the the Green Bastard or something. Anyways, Steve McQueen owned one, and the Peterson Auto Museum now owns it, and it's in their collection. And it is worth I would today I think it's worth at least twenty five million dollars. No kidding. Because of the the perfect storm connection of it being one of the rarest sports cars ever because of the factory fire combined with the fact that Steve McQueen owned it. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that is interesting because I've seen that. I probably took pictures of it too, but I didn't uh-huh. know. I didn't know because it wasn't the bullet car, so I was like, all right, whatever. But because <laughs> <Right. laughs> I'm not right. a car person. I mean, there's no, no, no disrespect intended towards sure. that. But, sure. Uh, I'm not even this. You know, I didn't really get Steve McQueen. You know, everyone was like, what a sex god he was or something like that i i didn't get it you know i mean i i i i just never understood it and i'm not saying he was unattractive but usually someone will catch your eye you know if they're beautiful and uh or good looking guy but it was like i didn't get steve mcqueen at all you know maybe it's because he wasn't a threat to to normal guys you know to regular guys it's like ron jeremy and porn you know you can watch him and because it's you're not threatened by it maybe that's what it was but i thought he was rather average looking i didn't think he was a sex god you you didn't get it but he could (laughs) right 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 right. and did and did he said i believe that he was supposed to be at the house on the night of the murders in Benedict uh, the, Canyon. Tate, the Tate murders, the Tate murders. Yeah. Yeah. But he, before he left, he got a call from an attractive blonde and an attractive mm. blonde decided to go with her instead. So, um, good choice. Yeah. yeah. But Steve McQueen, yeah, not an ugly guy, not by any stretch. I just never really, never really got it, but he was a guy's guy. He was definitely a guy's guy, fast right. cars and beautiful women. And that's, I guess that's what mattered, but and, it wasn't like a, a James Bond thing. And, yeah. Because James Bonds were always like really handsome men, you know, and and mm-hmm. and he was more rugged than handsome, I think. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Paul Newman was handsome. He also apparently turned down uh, the lead role in Close Encounters that Richard Dreyfuss ended up taking. He was Spielberg mm. wanted him for it, and McQueen supposedly turned it down because McQueen couldn't cry on, cry on cue, and there's that crying scene where Dreyfuss has the meltdown in his house, and his family freaks out. And Spielberg said, I'll, I'll take the scene out. I'll take it out. And McQueen said, it's the best scene in the script. You can't take it out. So that was it. He, he ended up not playing that role because of that. Hmm. Isn't that wild? I could totally see him in that part, too. I could totally see him doing that. I can't see him crying, but I can see the rest of it. Yeah. 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 I'd have to see that movie again. It's been a long, many, many oh, years since I've seen so that. So good. Um, so McQueen got... Um, 
mesothelioma. If you've seen the ads, it's asbestos-related cancer. And it's funny because he smoked, but apparently the cancer he got was from asbestos. And some people claim that it was from the asbestos used in the soundstage walls um, or that maybe it was from his race car driving suits, which have asbestos in them. Um, but he blamed it on uh, work that he had, he had to do when he was a Marine. He was in the Marines for a few years back in the 40s. And that's he, he said he got it from, I think he had to clean out old ducts or pipes or something, and they were wrapped in old asbestos. And he claimed that's where he got the exposure. So, you know, and, and time-wise, oh, it makes him... Yeah. I wonder if the three months of inhaling, you know, all sorts of fumes from this movie uh, <laughs> might have contributed a bit, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of ironic he dies from asbestos-related cancer and he played a fire chief who would have been wearing asbestos yeah. protective clothing if he was wearing the real stuff in the movie but yeah yeah it's so interesting asbestos because i mean we you know i grew up in asbestos schools you know i mean i remember i'm sure i like, did too, i was yeah. in eighth it, i was in eighth grade and i remember they closed the school for like a month and gutted it and redid it <laughs> uh because of that but it was like oh, been, you know so, so for seven and a half years we have been i've been you know eating this stuff basically with the movie theater i worked at was one of those old movie palaces and we had this massive asbestos curtain that we used to we used to lower down because it was a fire curtain so but the size of a movie screen you know it was like asbestos is everywhere so it's interesting more people didn't die from it but it's like it's <laughs> like uh what saccharin or something you know, one person dies and ruins it for everybody <laughs> Um, apparently he, he, I mean, he had cancer bad, unfortunately it spread and the doctors in the U S told him we can't, we can't save you. There's nothing we can do. And so that's when he turned to this, there was this quack doctor that he, who had these crazy, he was, I think really an orthodontist in real life who had these totally unproven treatments for cancer. And McQueen had to go down to Mexico in order to, you know, do it. And, uh, and of course it didn't work. And then toward the end, he had tumors. He had a big tumor in his abdomen and I think another one in his neck. And he wanted to have him removed. And again, the U.S. doctor said, your, your heart won't, your heart can't take the surgery. Mm -hmm. And he went through mm -hmm. with it anyways. He went down to Juarez and, and they were correct. And he, within, I think, about 12 hours after a surgical procedure, uh, he had a heart attack in his sleep at, in the early morning hours. And that's, that's how he died. So I yeah, would I, say, you know, if you're, if you're terminally ill, and somebody says they have a chance and the, whatever the Do FDA it. or whomever it is that regulates that here, because there's so many outrageous kind of, you know, uh, hoops that people have to jump through in a lot of ways. And, and, and for our protection, they say, but still sure. it's, if there's, it's like buying drugs, you know, you can, you can get, you can go down and get Valium in Mexico if you want to, you know, I mean, it's not that difficult. So if somebody's going to offer to do it, it's like people going over the border to, you know, have their pregnancies terminated. Um, you know, yeah, I can't just say that of... I would do anything. I can't say I would do any different than he did if I was in a situation and, yeah. you're not, you know, you're not going to win anyways. You might as well go down swinging and at least try, you know? Right. Didn't Andy Kaufman like go to, you know, some, it was like a, a an African country and you know, they did similar like a situation. Heart, yeah. yeah. And heart, like a heart massage. They oh, like opened up his chest or something. <laughs> it was just, there's footage of that, I think somewhere, but anyway, it's oh. uh so I, I kind of don't blame him, but I also, no, not at all. yeah. Yeah. Um, but he, he did die. He passed away in the early morning hours of November 7th, 1980. And it's just so weird. 1974 becomes the highest paid actor in the world disappears, makes nothing for like four years, comes back, makes three kind of minor films, in my opinion, and then dies. A very strange mm -hmm. end. Um, you know, and look, the other guy, Dennis Hopper, would disappear for, you know, months or years at a time and go on tours of the country and take photos and stuff. It was, you know, the hippie era. Um, yeah. But I've never, but it's very strange he did that and then just never really recovered because he got sick and died. Um, and they were going to do, he was under contract with Erwin, Erwin Allen to do another film and they were going to do the Inferno, the Towering Inferno 2. Uh, and he apparently was considering being in that. And I think he turned it down and they scrapped it not long before he, he died. So hmm. no Towering Inferno 2 for all of us, you know. They could have cut this one in half. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. William Holden, uh, we've talked about him before, but he, he plays the developer, right? The, uh, the, yeah. the, the, the one whose son-in-law messes everything up. Um, he apparently wanted top billing. 
And they were like, no, <laughs> it's not. Yeah, we got Steve McQueen not 19, here. And, not, uh, not in Paul Newman, not in 1974. You're not getting top billing over those guys. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because Holden, and we covered him, you know, ad nauseum in, uh, yeah. in our Sunset Boulevard podcast. But I forgot how, I forgot how young he was. You know, he was, he was, 63. he was like 63 or something. Yeah. When he um, died. Yeah. And he, I mean, he was a, he was a, he was a heavy drinker and he could have passed for 75. Uh, you know, and he looked pretty old in this movie and that would have been, you know, that would, he would have been probably what, 60? He would have been about, in his mid fifties. He would have been like 56 or 50s. so in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. And he looked like a lot older than that. Yeah. He looks like so, he's in his seventies in the movie. Yeah. Um, I mean, for people that haven't gone back and listened to that episode, just kind of the cliff notes version of his death was he was living in a. Uh, an, uh, an apartment uh, on the beach in Santa Monica and he had a fall in his bedroom, I believe, and hit his nightstand table and gashed his head Drunk. open and was, yeah. spo- was believed to have been like very, very intoxicated and didn't realize how badly he damaged, he hurt himself. He gashed his head open and I guess bloody Kleenexes were found and they think he was conscious for about half an hour after it happened, but just didn't, couldn't comprehend that he was in serious danger and he ended up. He, passed I, out he and probably was up. not in a. Yeah, he. I mean, he hit that table so hard that mm-hmm. it, what they say it pushed it an inch into the into the drywall. So right. that's a hell of a fall. So he probably didn't even know. It was, and he was drunk. I mean, that that I think that's been established uh, that he was. There was. I mean, the 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 proof of that was the empty bottle that was on the table next to him kind of a thing. And I imagine, I don't know right. if you can actually tech, check the toxicology, you know, when you've been dead for as long as he was, cause he was dead for a while, I believe uh, before his body yeah. was discovered, but still he was a famously, uh, you know, an alcohol abuser and a mean alcohol abuser. And uh, uh, yeah, not, not a, a really bitter guy, but it didn't come off that way in this movie. He was very likable. You know, no. despite the fact that it wasn't even his fault, actually, that this whole accident happened. But he, nope. he kind of was taking the fall for it in a lot of ways. Uh, right. Yeah. No, but I'm bump. Took the ah. fall for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, he passed away on uh, William Holden passed away on November 12th, 1981. Um, and I mean, for me, he's he is Sunset Boulevard. So it's kind of yeah. hard for me to even picture him in anything else, even though he did so much else. Um, Fred Astaire, who uh, would have been in uh, well into his seventies and and looked 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 it, uh, plays an old uh, con man who is trying to uh, con. Uh, was it Lizalette? What did what did we settle on? Lizal, I think it's Lizalette. Yeah, jo- Lizalette. Joanna Cassidy. Yeah, I mean not Joanna Cassidy. He, um, Jennifer Jones. Yes. Sorry. Um, and he um, plays an old con man. He's there to kind of rip her off, and he, then he decides he's in love with her and and confesses to her that he was going to you know sell her stocks and stuff that didn't exist. And um, and then and then she falls off the elevator and spins like a top, uh, ninety floors to the bottom. <laughs> she was very. She didn't deserve much... it, Scott. <laughs> no, but she was. She, she was like the the Shelley Winters character. You know when they when they did that mm. that that stairway scene. And you, you just, you know, she was wearing the nice flowing dress and she had to climb down this thing, just like Shelly had to climb up that, uh, that in the Poseidon adventure, climb up the Christmas tree. But she was like the sacrifice that had to be done to teach him a lesson because he was a con man. Uh, so I think that, uh, I think that's why they, they killed her off in the movie. Kind of a but, bad uh, deal for was, her, man. Yeah. That was sort of the surprise part of the movie. That was the surprise, uh, death in the movie. I think that's true. That's true. Cause usually it's, they get people that get it, deserve it. And she didn't. Yeah. No, but Fred Astaire um, so, did. So this is the crazy thing. Fred Astaire got his only Oscar nomination of his entire career from this movie for a uh, best supporting actor. Isn't that crazy? He didn't win, yeah. but it's the only time he w- he got an honorary Oscar in 1950. Um, but he had, he'd never, I can't believe he'd never been nominated for a legit Oscar and the towering inferno in 1974 is what he gets it for all the stuff he did. He did the, he was not an actor, I guess he was more of a dancer, yeah. but he acted, yeah. but he was never, everything he started billing in was as a dancer, I guess. Sure. Yeah. That's what it was. Interesting. Yeah. Um, he didn't get the Oscar for this, but he did win a golden globe for, I think best supporting actor. So. He, he, I mean, he had to have weighed seventy-five pounds. 
you know, soaking wet. He was he was right. not a he was a very like always looked kind of thin, but he's very frail. Um, yeah, very very frail. It was just kind of funny how at the beginning of the movie is is like his first scene is taking a taxi to this to this office building. And and he gets out of the taxi, and it's a ninety a ninety five cent fare in a taxi. <laughs> I know it's, it's it's very indicative of the time period. And he's counting up pennies. It's like it was just the funniest thing because you know now they wouldn't even. It's like immediately at five dollars when you walk in, get into a taxi <laughs> anymore. Whoever goes into taxis anymore, but. Um, but yeah, it's just, it was just kind and of a funny thing. And he doesn't tip the guy, so, right? He says, I'll tip you next time or something like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, yeah what, a, what an amazing person. And funny that out of all those movies, like you said, never an Oscar nomination except for this movie. Got a Golden Globe uh, for this movie. I think a mm-hmm. BAFTA as well. And uh, it's, just, it's just for this silly movie that's largely forgettable, except for the epic nature of it. Uh, right. A lot of people would even sit, would even, wouldn't even know he was in it unless you... Unless you, uh, you know, pointed it out. So he was, at the end of his life, he was married to a woman who was 45 years younger than him. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. No. <laughs> but no, 45 years, though, that's impressive, you know. That she, but, uh, but apparently she loved him very much. And now I don't know if this is true. Can you actually, he, he, they say they had it in his will. His wife's name was Robin Smith. And he, they said that he had it in his will that he, his, he, he can't be portrayed in screen. Oh, so they can't like tell his, the, the Fred Astaire story or whatever. Yeah. She said that she would never, she promised to never give permission to portray him in a film. And in his hmm. will, he said he he requested that no such portrayal ever take place. It's because it's there the the codicil whatever is there because I have no particular desire to have my life my life misinterpreted, which it would be. Which uh, I don't, but you can't you don't have control of that, can you? You can make a Fred Astaire biopic if you wanted to. You can't really stop somebody without from the doing es- that. without the estate's permission. I don't know that you could do an entire film on him. You could probably get away with having him be a character in another film, someone else's story. You might be able to get away with not um, going and getting his, you know, life story rights from his estate. But if you wanted to do like the Fred Astaire story, like a biography on him, I th- you I, uh, you could write an unauthorized biography as a book. So I that's freaking it's a legal, interesting legal area, and it continues to be an interesting legal area whether or not you'd be able to do that. Or yeah, not. I mean, you you would consider it. Uh... Uh, a tribute or a what was that term that Molly Shannon used about a send up? It, it was uh, anyway, but it was uh, you know I can't see how as, as somebody being a public persona. Right. Now, if you're talking about movie clips, if you're talking about you know recreating like MGM movies, there there's a copyright issue there. Sure. I can understand that, but him as a as a human being, I I don't know. It's just interesting. I don't know. But she and promised I don't know she'd never if it's do a- that. And I don't know if it's a thing like copyright where it expires after a certain amount of years. Like, obviously, if they're going to, you know, they do an Abraham Lincoln biopic, they're not going and tracking down his (laughs) his (laughs) heirs to see, you know what I mean, his descendants to get permission. So at a certain point, um, you don't have to. So I I do wonder at what point that it's kind of a gray area. And, Tom, and I doubt there's going to be people knocking down doors for the Fred Astaire life story either. You know, I mean, he was, I mean, I don't mean that in a nasty way. He's... And I can tell you when they do do big, you know, true f- films, uh, true story films, there are always um, extra characters in those that are portrayed that they did not go and get the permission from that person to do it. Right. Um, one of the most mm-hmm. famous ones is uh, Jerry Heller, who was the manager for NWA, you know, when they did the, um, straight out of Compton film, he's portrayed in that movie and they did not consult with him. He's played by an actor and he actually um, was filing a lawsuit at the time of his death against them for his portrayal. They thought his portrayal was defamatory. So, Mm -hmm. so if it's like part of a big ensemble and it's not the main focus, I think they can kind of get away with it. But if it's about the person specifically, I don't know how that works. But anyway, that's supposedly in his will. That's what he had. Now, what I found a bit, that kind of made me blanch a little bit was that on when he died, he's, he died in, um, well, you probably have the date right there. I don't can't, I don't have it right up the top of my head. It's, uh, uh, he it's died on June, old. June 22nd, 1987. He was 88 years old. He died from pneumonia. Pneumonia. And I think he was born in 1899. 
Yeah. Yeah. My grandmother was born in 1888. What? You know, it's bizarre to think that I, yeah, I grew up with a what? woman who was born in the 1800s. Yeah. She died what? in 77 and she was 88 years old. So, uh, wow. knowing people that lived in, I wish I had known to, to ask them that, you know, the questions right. about that, um, you know, being there, you know, the first time they saw a television or the first time they heard a telephone or I saw a car because they were old school. I mean, I remember they had old phones. They had party lines. They didn't even have their own phone line. You know, they would. No. Uh, it's it's, it's yeah, where, where I uh, where I lived. Uh, I spent about half my childhood in Colorado and out in the sticks. I had friends that still had yeah. party lines. They still had party lines in the nineties, <laughs> yeah. nineteen nineties, not the eighteen nineties. <laughs> It's crazy to think that people multiple homes sharing the same phone. It's kind of weird. So I remember when we would leave my grandmother's house and we would get home. She wanted to know we got home, but she didn't want anyone to know what we were doing. So we would call and and ring once so no one else would pick up the phone. Or either that, she'd say hello and we'd hang up. But that was just so other Uh. people didn't know what was what was going on. But um, but anyway, back that's to the first year. That's the, that's who we're talking huh. about. So he he you know his his widow was forty five years younger than him. Now what I find, as I said, what makes me kind of blanch a little bit is that when he died, a, a gravestone was put on his grave. He's at Oakwood Memorial Park. It's the same place where actor Stephen Boyd was. The Bob Crane was there until his wife had. Uh, had uh, had him exhumed and took him to Westwood Cemetery. His gravestone says something to the effect, I will always love you, my dear. You know, had nothing. It didn't say actor, dancer, extraordinaire. It right. was, I will always love you, my dear. It, it was just, to me, it kind of was like, it's not about you, love. You know, I understand it's about <laughs> you, but it's really about him. This is his forever place. People forever are going to come to visit and pay their respects to him. And right. they're going to go, who's I? Who is I? You know, why Why? Are you, why is your personal message on, on his tombstone? It's her right. She paid for it. And sure. it's her completely in her, you know, in her right to do that. But it just made me uncomfortable. It's like, well, not about you, really. But It's weird. We talked in our last show, I think, about a dispute over a headstone. It's funny how that happens. Uh, with, uh, was it with Sinatra? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's never, never about the person. It's never about the person's wishes. I just saw a story about them moving John Barrymore's body. His son did it. And, yeah. and the whole thing about it, because his, his Barrymore wanted to be buried back, I think back East with the family, the family plot. And he wasn't, he was buried out here. And the son finally was like, screw that. We're, we're, we're going to. The son and the grandson were like, we're going to move him. And they basically, I think they, they were going to have to have the whole family sign the paperwork. And they kind of like, eh, kind of fudged that a little bit just because they didn't want to deal with all the various personalities that they would have to deal with. They just wanted to, they never felt it was right that his, his wishes weren't honored um, where he wanted to be put. And they moved him. Yeah, I mean, it's about what they wanted done, I think. I mm-hmm. think. I mean, we'll look at when they ripped off Graham Parsons' body and set him on fire. You know, he in, uh, <laughs> in the desert. You know, I mean, he they they knew it's not what he wanted, and they 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 stole his body and and lit it on fire, trying to cremate him, not realizing that you know, it takes a little bit more than gasoline to uh, to cremate somebody. You know, it's <laughs> there's a lot of remains to go through, but still, it's uh, trying to honor him the best you way the best way you can. But um, I don't personal post-its on people's graves <laughs> don't, don't really fly right. but that's me that's me it's not it's not for me to say not for me mm-hmm. to say well it is because i just said it <laughs> <laughs> it is for you to say scott your opinion matters yes um i put uh jennifer jones down next is that a good one to go to yeah that's fine i mean she's a she's a a sad individual. I mean, I was talking about, you know, she had some breaks, some bad breaks. and She had um, a history of uh, psychological problems, and she at one point attempted suicide. Uh, she jumped off a cliff in Malibu, and I think her daughter eventually did commit suicide later, and she was a big advocate for mental health awareness. Uh, that was her co- her big yeah. cause. Um, she uh, was nominated for five Oscars, one of them being for The Towering Inferno, which was her last film. Um, before she went into retirement and she won uh, best actress for um, 
the song of Bernadette. And she was the sixth youngest actress to ever win a Best Actress Oscar. She won it on her 25th birthday. Only uh, Hepburn beat her by 40 days for Roman Holiday as being younger than her. But she was the sixth youngest actress to ever win it. Yep. Hmm. Um, and there was something else. Oh, I was just going to say, she should have won an award for marrying well. She married David O. Selznick until he died. And then she married the, the, industri- the wealthy industrialist Norton Simon. Uh, mm-hmm. After that, and of, co- of course, who has uh, an excellent art museum called the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena. It's a really good little art museum. And uh, apparently, according to Wikipedia, um, some of the artwork that appears at the beginning of this film is from Norton Simon's collection. Really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. I wonder why. Yeah. I mean, I know they, they own the Blue Boy and the Pink Lady. Those are the ones I know because I, I am only familiar with, like, the masterpieces. I really like if you're in um, Southern California and you need a museum that's not like a full day, like, you know, LACMA or the Getty is, uh, Norton Simon's a really nice, like, you know, one one or two hour visit to, yeah. you know, see a nice space with some nice art, but not be overwhelmed by it, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think about it? Oh, her? yeah. It was her, it was her daughter <laughs> with uh, Selznick, I think, that died. She jumped. She jumped, too. I mean, yeah. Jennifer Jones tried to. And uh, well, she did, and uh, they yeah. found her. And they, but then the daughter jumped. She's twenty second floor of a building somewhere downtown, Terrible. I think. Yeah, um, yeah. But at and, least she embraced it afterwards in the mental illness thing, and was a real advocate for, you know, therapy yeah. and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. Get help if you get get help. Um, yeah. The um, her ash and her ashes are interred with Selznick, not Norton Simon, uh, over at Forest Lawn. So. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, she is uh, just, I got to say, she was like the Shelley Winters character of this movie. She was likable and mm-hmm. uh, a bit awkward and clearly fish out of water and, uh, you know, but likable. And, and surprisingly, we should put a disclaimer, you know, at the beginning, well, you know, that there's this, just all of the spoilers in the world <laughs> are in this. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, she was uh, like the surprising death of all the deaths in the movie. That was the one I didn't see coming. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and she passed away on December 17th, 2009 at the age of 90 from natural causes. Rest in peace. And then the last actor that I really wanted to talk about, and I really wanted to talk about this um, for you, Scott, was uh, Robert Vaughn, um, who is best known for being in the Magnificent Seven and Bullet and Superman 3 and Delta Force and The Man from UNCLE. Um, but I wanted to talk about this one because I know how much you love a good Hollywood paternity dispute. And there's a really good one <laughs> yeah. with Robert Vaughn. There's a really good one with Robert yes, Vaughn. Yeah, so um, the famous producer and director Matthew Vaughn, a British director um, who produced Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch and directed Layer Cake and Kick-Ass and X-Men First Class and the Kingsman movies um, and is married to Claudia Schiffer. He, for the first like 30 some years of his life believed that he was Robert Vaughn's son and was named Matthew Vaughn, took on his surname and came to find out in 2002 that his real father was a British aristocrat and was not. Do we know who? Uh, Yeah. um, Hold on. I'll tell you. It's a name I can't really pronounce very well. One of these very aristocratic, like 10 name names, George de Verdremund Hmm. or Verdemund. So Matthew Vaughn has changed his last name personally to how we pronounce De Verdemund, De Verdemund. Um, but you know, professionally, he's still Matthew Vaughn because that's kind of you know, that's how everybody knows him. But he does not go by that in his personal life anymore. And here's the extra drama: his mother found out that that Robert Vaughn was not the father back in the '80s and didn't tell her son. So he didn't find out. Oh, well, that's very British, though. It's very British. That's true, like, oh, right? We just won't say anything. <laughs> it's know, the dark secret, away. and every family has their dark secret we don't discuss. Yeah. Right. I mean, she must have known. I mean, well, I mean, well, maybe she didn't, but uh, um, yeah. that that is that's really interesting. I mean, because th- I knew it's an odd. He had a career in England that I didn't even know about. I mean, he was in a, he was in a British soap opera in the two thousands, in the you know in the early two thousands called Coronation Street, which is like a 
you know, it's like a real British thing. It's not like, mm-hmm. you know, of now it's, it is like so British. It's not even true. And he was in that for a while. And it was like, that surprised me on his IMDb page. And he did, he was in little Britain. Uh, he was in an episode of the, huh. of the comedy show, little Britain. So he had a real connection to England. Now I know why, because of his son, but I didn't, uh, I didn't know that before. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Very. And Robert Vaughn lived in the two, 2016. So, or, so Robert lived long enough to know the truth and for his son to know the truth. And I think um, gave Matthew Vaughn or, or permission or, or it, it urged him to keep the last surname or said, you can keep, you know, calling yourself that if you want to. And so that was nice, I guess. But yeah. So he didn't even know, I guess. I guess nobody not. knew. Not who, until the, who, not, who I think the parents, decides... I, I, the mother supposedly found out in the 1980s. So I would imagine Robert Vaughn probably found out also in the 1980s. Mm. Um, yeah. Crazy. Wow. He, I remember when, when, uh, when this, I, you know, I, we talked about this in the Jaws podcast. I was a huge, huge fan of Jaws. And I remember when this movie came out, there was uh well, no, it would have been after Jaws and Jaws was 75. Anyway, Robert Vaughn was going to be on the Tonight Show. And I remember like, I was never a Tonight Show fan, but I say that because I thought it was going to be Murray Hamilton who played Mayor Vaughn in Jaws. So I thought, Mar- <laughs> you know, it was so stupid as a kid. But I was like, oh my God, the mayor from Jaws is going to be on the Tonight Show. And it was Robert Vaughn. I was so disappointed. <laughs> but, um, that's but, um, hilarious. Man from Uncle was a great show. I loved that show. And uh, mm. and that's a, that was one of those trivia questions when people ask about Man from Uncle. It was what actually did Uncle stand for? And it's uh, oh. United Network, United Network Command for Law Enforcement. Aw. Wow, and uh, but it's also another British thing because they they're they're you know remember Get Smart it was Chaos was the name of their their anti mm-hmm. spy you know their their and this one was Thrush and Thrush is like you know it's like a yeast infection so and there you know it's just kind of funny you know Thrush <laughs> and there had to be some some laugh well, some laughs there and he was also in Pootie Tang which I love I love that movie Pootie <laughs> <laughs> don't forget that. <laughs> I love that movie. Have you ever seen Pootie Tang? It's, I, it's a I have very not. funny movie. Sarate. It's a very funny movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. It is good. It is a good movie. But anyway, yeah. So Robert Vaughn died. Uh, he died November 11th, 2016. He was 83. Uh, and he had been getting treatment for leukemia for the year leading up to his death. So my assumption is that that's, that was what caused it or contributed was leukemia. Yeah. Yeah. By all, I mean, I know that Jeff uh, Man- Mentor, who owns Larry Edmonds Bookstore, uh, Larry, he was friendly with Robert Vaughn. He'd come in uh, every once in a while uh, to this old Hollywood bookstore. The last one is left in Hollywood. And so it was neat that he was uh, mm. a cool guy that supported, you know, the old bookstore. It was neat. Right. Um, so Robert Vaughn's the last one I had on my list. Uh, luck- luckily, a lot of the actors in this film are still alive. That's nice. Yeah. Robert, Wag- and, and Robert Wagner that, is still alive and Faye Dunaway is still alive. And, you know, he has Faye Dunaway. She was a, she's, I'm, you know, she's not good. She's just, she's <laughs> like a stiff as a board, you know? I mean, mommy dearest, I can't see anything else but that. She won an Academy Award for a network. I got to watch that one again because it's really good. Every, she plays kind of a really badass ball busting career woman. Who's she's kick-ass in that. I like her. I just think she's awful in this movie and she and she did her typical face stuff. You know, she showed up late and and people were you uh, know, she show, I said they had like the paperwork they were showing Miss Dunaway showed up 90 minutes late and people were just leaving the set. You know, Robert I know yeah. Holden. In fact, they say that there was a, a confrontation between you know Holden they say slammed her against the wall and said, uh, you know, quit messing around and after that she showed up on time after well, you know, after that. But uh, but she's famously Holden's like, you know, I'm half in the bag by noon. We got to get this done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt. But she is I mean, she's got such a terrible reputation. And hmm. I, we've probably talked about this on uh, before when there's a great appearance of Betty Davis on The Tonight Show. She did a movie with Faye Dunaway called The Disappearance of Sister Amy, which is about the evangelist Amy Semple McPherson. And there, there was a period of time where she she was unaccounted for. And Betty Davis played her mother. So 
Betty Davis was asked on the Tonight Show, close to her death, so in the late in the mid eighties, mid to late eighties, is there anyone that you would that you did not enjoy working with? And she said, one hundred percent, hands down, Faye Dunaway. And she was never a person <laughs> to name names. Betty Davis was never right. one to trash. She, but she said she was the most unprofessional person I've ever worked with. And people in the audience were giggling. She's like, "This is not funny. I'm not saying this <laughs> to be funny." She showed up late, you know, she, and I had to. You know, there's a courtroom scene and she wouldn't even show up. And Betty Davis would, you know, try to entertain the, the, the extras there because they're sitting there in the heat and Dunaway shows up late. But Davis goes on a real tear about her. And that's to, for Betty Davis, who could not be more professional to to actually throw Faye down like that um, was very revealing. And people, there are lots of those stories. Don't you don't you know who I am? Stories of her right. in stores and. Uh, you know, throwing things and hitting people with things and throwing things at people. And so um, she's notorious it's, for being that way. It's too bad because I think my favorite photo of a celebrity ever is the famous one of her by the pool at the Beverly Hills Hotel uh, the morning after she won the Oscar for Network. I love yeah. that photo so much. It's such an yeah. interesting with the newspaper pages all spread out on the ground below her and she's just chilling by the pool uh, with her Oscar sitting there on the table with, you know, her tea or whatever or coffee or whatever it was on the table. Yeah, I I, I love that photo. I agree. It's too bad to hear. It's, too that bad is to hear a, it's like the second the second wave, the peak of the second wave of the Hollywood Golden Age, like right. Golden Age Part Two, and uh, and yeah, that's all the Evans business and Nicholson and mm -hmm. uh, all those. You know, that was whoever thought those would be the Golden Age again. You know, that's <laughs> that's so funny because they're over. I mean, all, so many of those guys are dead or dying that uh, there is. It's like, what's next? I'm right. afraid that I'm afraid to even think it. Really, <laughs> you know, there's something to be said for the studio system. So, um, but yeah, anyway, Faye was a piece of work, and she and I, yeah, you know, she was, she was, she was, she was Faye. She was Faye. <laughs> um, but I, the other people that I had, uh, I was just going to go on about some of the some of the moments in the in the show in the movie because yeah. there's so many interesting. Uh, well, first of all, I thought this is unrelated, but related. I thought the Poseidon Adventure was the first disaster film, but it was actually Air Airport in 1970 that was the first. The Airplane, first of I'm the sorry. big set, the first of the big 70s uh, disaster movies. Disaster movies, kind of yeah. So I thought, you know, huh. I thought that uh, the Poseidon Adventure was the groundbreaker there, but no, it was actually this other one, Air. Airplane? That can't be right. No, airplane's airplane the comedy is spoof. spoof. Airport be... is the one. Airport, yeah. I, I mean, airplane, they did a whole bunch. It's... They did a whole string of airport movies right. to make people yeah. terrified and... of flying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, uh, now somebody I had it written down, and that somebody in this movie was in Airport seventy nine. Oh, uh, Susan Blakely, who played Richard Chamberlain's wife in the movie, she was in the Concord Air, uh, Airport 79. Oh, right Those were great movies because they, I mean, they had people like, you know, Gloria Swanson and Jimmy Stewart were in these, were in these airplanes. <laughs> they were, mm. they were cool. I mean, these are people that had a week to kill, you know, and you go to the right. studio up the road and they have the phony <laughs> airplane set up and, you know, why not? I'll make 50 grand and go home sure. with it. No problem. Yeah. Right, right, so, right. <laughs> but, um, so uh, some of the moments that if, in the movie that I found were, uh, interesting. Well, for, oh, there's, we didn't say anything about well, uh, Bobby Brady with the headphones. That was he shows up at the beginning of the movie. Mike Lookinland, who is Bobby Brady, who is the precocious young boy, just like Eric Shea was in the Poseidon Adventure, and right. he's he has these headphones on. They're wireless, but they're like this big, and they're with big antennas and <laughs> right. something like that. So that was that was another uh, comparison to the Poseidon Adventure. Was the precocious young boy? The fire started in a room break in a breaker box on the eighty first floor thought it was interesting because the breaker box op opens and when i was a boy scout one of the first things they taught you was like for some reason oily rags existed be careful <laughs> of oily rags because they're a fire hazard and yes. that was like what i was never where did it, where did oily rags ever happen but right. that's what it was in the 81st floor of this office building is a pile of oily rags about six pans of six cans of spray paint and these five gallon drums <laughs> that don't say anything except flammable flammable <laughs> <laughs> it's like it is what funny. the contents are we don't know but it's all in one time every single it's like it make a nuclear bomb in that tiny little storage cabinet <laughs> with everything it was in there and yet it still right. took a really long time for it to actually catch on fire 
Um, and then they, uh, there was a scene where Steve McQueen uh, shows up and he goes to the 81st floor and they're trying to get this thing under control and it's not working. And he has to go to the upper floors to, I guess, warn people up there to get ready to go or something. But so he literally walks about 20 feet to an elevator 20 feet from the fire to get onto an elevator to take it up in the building, which is, again, the first thing that happens when there's a fire in a building, elevators get shut down and you use the stairs. But here's the the chief of the fire, you know, the fire brigade going and using the elevator 20 feet. I mean, I'm not even joking, like right around the corner from the flames. And he gets into an elevator, uh, which is it's just funny. There is there are a couple of um, uh, there for some it's an inexplicable thing on the bar in the promenade room is a lighted candle. I noticed it about three times. It's nothing. There's no <laughs> attention brought to it. And it's not like it's an atmospheric candle, like those pretty ones that sit as centerpieces. It is like a single white candle on the bar in the middle of the scene, three times in the movie. I don't know why it's there, but it's a lighted candle on fire. Distracting if you catch it, but it, it, there must be some kind of symbolism to that. Uh, uh, you know, very obvious symbolism if it is, but uh I, I just somebody yeah. it had to be somebody's it had to be somebody's you know joke or something. Uh, there were a lot of featured extras in the movie. There's a couple that like at the beginning when Paul Newman walks in, somebody walks by and says hello there, whatever your name is, and not even the, not even facing the camera. And I would have swore that would have been like Irwin Allen's cameo or something like that. But I googled like crazy, couldn't find anything. But it was one of those weird. That's odd. You know, here's this this mm-hmm. guy that's blocking Paul Newman's face and saying this weird line that's oddly focused on. And uh, mm-hmm. so I, there was there, there was. But I do know that Irwin Allen's wife was in this movie and his girlfriend was in this movie. And his what? girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His girlfriend Not played clear. the mayor's wife. And the mayor, and she's a featured extra. She's a she's not a not a not a slim woman. She's got a pink dress and the most awful blonde wig on her head. And and they show her in a ton of scenes. They show her she's one of the people on the scenic elevator. And I didn't know it until I watched the retrospective thing that she was she was interviewed and she was Irwin Allen's girlfriend at the time. But his real wife was in the movie, so I don't know what their relationship was like. But this woman, uh, she shows up a lot in the movie, and she actually looked younger twenty years after the movie than she did uh, in the um, in the actual movie. They say mm-hmm. that well, Steve McQueen. There's one really interesting scene where I I thought it was strange. He was during the movie. I mean, it's a two hour forty five minute movie. There's a scene where he's sitting with the other other firefighters on the floor in the lobby. Now, how he goes from way up there to down to the lobby, but he's sitting there, you know, taking a rest with the other firefighters, which, okay, I was like, all right, I'm like, it's weird, but I'm, I'm, I'm on board with it. But it turns out that he screwed up his foot in a, um, in a, uh, in a scene and he had to do several scenes sitting. So that's why they oh, had him. That's why they had him in the movie, how they had, uh, how they had, uh, they had him sitting for, which was weird, but that explained it more so than uh th- for me anyway uh another out- ridiculous moment was uh outside the promenade room where the big event was happening the opening the launch of this whole thing with all the dignitaries the senator and the mayor right outside like two fire doors and one of them on the other side is cement blocking it like mm. like a, a wheelbarrow of cement <laughs> you know dried on the door this fire door of this this amazing building and the thing is that the platform is only about 20 feet long by five feet so how a wheelbarrow of of concrete (laughs) is up there and tipped over and the fireman can't get in and he just happens to have uh uh plastic explosives explosive to blow it up something firefighters carry with them in their pockets yeah Yeah. it's kind of funny Uh, i love that kind of stuff and there is a there is another scene that uh, oh the helicopter rescue yeah, there's a big part where you know the helicopter comes and they're going to lift airlift people off of the roof of the building 
and the helicopters come military. I believe it was the Navy that was that was mm, landing the helicopter so, there. Yeah. Uh, and these two women extras run towards this thing, and he flips and smashes up and explodes. Well, first of all, you never see any of the wreckage like landing on the road below. It's not, you know, it's just this explosion. The end. But those two women <laughs> who ran up to it and caused the accident go right back into the crowd, and everyone's like comforting them because like they're scared. It's like I would have thrown him off the roof. You know, it's like you just screwed this up. <laughs> You screwed up our chance to rescue. You. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they're like, oh, come here. Oh, you poor thing. It's like, no, you screwed it up because it's telling you, stay back here. And these two idiots go running for it. And they, 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 so that, that pissed me off. But it was wow. interesting. There's so, I mean, there's so many weird little, weird little things. But most of the special effects were good. The weird, the worst of it, I believe, was the Steve McQueen scenic elevator bit when they showed him being you know airlifted like this behind the elevator that was that was really bad that was that was like comically bad that was like a carol burnett skit or something like that it was really (laughs) (laughs) but um yeah but that i mean i think those are all i think all my notes about about how the the points i wanted to to make they say that paul newman supposedly developed an allergy to smoke well that that's sort of a silly thing because that sounds like an urban legend yeah it sounds like something that would happen to anybody on the set who's around. Because that was like a hot set. I mean, literally a hot set. He was also a heavy smoker, like well into like, I think he quit in like 1986 or something like that and ultimately died from mm. cancer. So I don't, if he was a heavy smoker, I don't think he became allergic to set, <laughs> to, to fake smoke. <laughs> that sounds right. crazy. Yeah, no doubt. And one thing I really like about these old disaster movies is that they are little time capsules. And they, they show you what people were concerned about at the time, right? Like, you know, the airport movies is, I think, because uh, commercial flight started becoming accessible to the masses and a lot more flights. And so air disasters became like a hot thing in air safety, right? And then if you look at the timing, uh, the Sears Tower, which is now called the Willis Tower, was finished the year before this movie. Or no, it was finished the year this movie was made. And then, as you said at the top, the World Trade Center was finished the year before. And so I, it gives you the and there's a very there's definitely a message that they're trying to wrap around this film about the safety of these super tall buildings that were starting to get built. It was almost like we were in like a, a skyscraper arms race in the 70s and people were concerned about the ramifications, you know, of the of the engineering yeah. and stuff like that. And, you know, obviously, sure. and now, they're first, you know, yeah, first and yeah. foremost, are making a disaster movie, but they also you get the kind of social message that came with it. Um, well, they're certainly they're playing with 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 what scares people the most now. You know, right. the pandemic movies and zombie movies, <laughs> and you know right. what did we just lived through for the last ninety or you know thirteen or fifteen months. You know, right. it was literally like a zombie movie when when this first you know everything was locked down. Just you know, yep. you'd see a few people running around, but that was yeah. And, and you know what's funny? There was another scene in, in this movie that really stood out as really scary, and it's when that group of people. You know, everyone's freaking out in panic, and they they say, "Don't use the elevators." But then the elevators doors open, and everyone panics and, and gets runs. on them. Right. And then the doors shut, and they can't stop it. And then the next thing you know, the doors open, and they are on a different floor, and they all get burned up. But that was it was like uh, <laughs> it was like Dawn of the Dead. You know, when you're on an elevator, it's like your worst fear. What's a, what's going to happen when you open it? In Dawn sure. of the Dead, there was this pile of zombies right there. Just, the doors open, it's like, Bleh! and that's that's just what this was too. It's a it's another one of those irrational. It's not irrational. It's just a fear that uh, you know what's going to happen when you open up that door. It could go very wrong. And, right. Uh, and they played on that for sure. But um, yeah, they they I guess there was also an issue with this movie because the um, I don't know the. Builders Association, whomever they are, were pissed because they sure. were not. It wasn't an accurate portrayal of how things are really built, of course. And, right. Uh, so, so, but but nobody's not going up in those buildings, you know, not having right. a problem renting them out. Do you ever go up to right. the top of the Sears Tower? I've never even been to Chicago except through the airport. So no. Oh, that's such a great town. It really is. Have you? And, is uh, it cool? and architecturally, I'm not a nerd about architecture. I mean. I don't, I'm not, a, it's a, it doesn't bother me. I like distinctive buildings like the Transamerica Tower in San Francisco. I love that because it's a triangle. Yeah. Well, um, Chicago has some really distinctive, amazing office buildings. Yeah. And the Sears Tower is, I went up to the top of it once, I think. And it was on one of those days that you, know, you got to the top, it was so cloudy, you couldn't even see out. 
but they have uh, they're they're trying to make these things more desirable for tourists to go to them mm-hmm. because people need more and more thrills. So they're doing right. that thing like in the John Hancock building. They did it's called Tilt, where you're at the top and they, yes. they you get on this bar and you go. I did no that. I, I, I'm scared to death of hikes, but but I did do that and it was. I'm glad I did it. But the Sears Tower has a glass. They built out like a you know I don't know maybe ten foot extension and it's glass floor so you stand on this and you're looking straight down and this is a couple of years ago i think there's even video of this it cracked while these people were on it you know just yeah. like shattered now, i mean they it was it was you know it was protected 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 50 times but you're still on it and it shatters and you're like oh my god that would just that would just i'd lose it and that's another rabbit hole i go down when i'm on youtube there's that one bridge that they had it it was like a glass bridge and they had it set up so it did fake cracks like it was it was broad you know right. so people are on it out. and they show it to me. oh my god i could now, watch those all night i love those i videos. will confess that i did um the u.s <laughs> bank tower in downtown la the one that they blow up in independence day yeah they have a, yeah. a glass slide yeah the past couple of years i did go and do that uh with with our, our mutual friend kelly i got i was not down to do it and then as soon you had to buy a ticket to get up there and so yeah. i had a ticket just to go up and i was going to watch them go and then as soon as i saw it i was like i'm doing it and i was the first one in the group to go down it was awesome but it was you know yeah. you slide down it really fast it's over super quick you know what i mean it's, it's like, like two a seconds quick, like, or something it's like yeah. a three second yeah. thrill as you fl- slide down it and then you're you're over but to actually stand on a glass floor and look down and dwell on it no i'm not that's a little much i'm not i'm not down with yeah that. it was it was the, the the tilt thing i did i was glad i did it and i don't i believe i did it but i did and i'm glad i did it but <laughs> i it, couldn't do it it is um yeah it was it was weird it was really weird but you know i guess I, somebody said if i do fair if i go parachuting once that i'll get over my fear of heights because i have that there's a term for it i just heard the other day i can't remember what it is when you get to the top of a building you get that urge to jump i get that a <laughs> lot like my stomach flips and i'm just like i i feel like i want to go and that's why i'm what? like usually on my hands and knees on a roof because i can't if i get too right. close i get the urge to jump not it's not a desire to jump it's just like it's sure. like a magnetic power that it has to do that huh. and uh and it, it really I get that a lot with those, you know, with those uh, POV videos on YouTube where people are jumping around on buildings and stuff like that. Do you ever watch those? Those kids up in like the Ukraine who have nothing, yeah. <laughs> nothing to they're lose, crazy. so they're, they're jumping crazy. around on these little, you know, twisting up and down on their bikes and stuff. And I, I watch those, and it's like, oh man, I just, yeah, it's, it's, it's something. But you know, those, those people die doing scares. that fairly regularly too. It, it's crazy, and, and you clicks. can't really go. Yeah, those poor people. Well, no, because you really, they don't call them, you know, <laughs> the, the right. daredevils for nothing, you know? Right. But uh, so the movie, I guess it, they exploit, you know, this horrible thing that happened, this disaster, and all these people die. But what I really like is there was a message that, that was that was on the screen, and it was a dedication, which I loved. And it mm. said, uh, it said, to those who give their lives – so that others might live to the firefighters of the world. This picture is gratefully dedicated. And I thought that was really, you know, I hope it wasn't gratuitous. I thought it was quite, I thought it was, you know, I hope it wasn't something go, Oh, we got to do that. (laughs) But it was just nice (laughs) because, because there again, people that don't, you know, the people that don't get the, the, the nods that they deserve. And uh, although it's a fictional movie and, and silly, could you imagine though a fire on like the 80th floor and being on the ground? It's just like the world trade center to me, you know, it just, it's that same thing. What do you do with that? And they, they show these guys, you know, on the 80th floor, having to walk to the 135th floor to that, you know, and you could see them, they're like dying. And that's, that's what those poor guys in in New York did, you know, and, and, oh, just, just, oh, I couldn't believe it. The stamina that they have to have, let alone, you know, the skills that they have to have and the bravery. It's, well, God bless them, man. God bless them. And that is it. The Towering Inferno has been done again. Sorry we spoiled a, uh, you know, 45-year-old movie or whatever it is, a 47-year-old movie. Um, but go watch it anyways, because it's. I think, like to your point at the beginning, it still holds up uh, really well and is a fun little time capsule. Uh, it's good special effects. It's a silly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's it, the acting. Yeah, it's it just. Yeah, it's a time <laughs> capsule. The special effects are the star of this movie. I think. Yeah. I really do. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, McQueen and, 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 and Numa were good. They were really good in it. But I thought the spe- special effects by far were the star of this movie. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, always fun to do. And um, if you are, um, <clears throat> we just recorded another Patreon episode for our Patreon subscribers. So if you go to Patreon and look up Dearly Departed Podcast, um, we uh, uh, we do extra, like, small, shorter episodes that we post there every month. And um, we also give uh, people there a, a day or two um, sneak peek look at these this new episode like this one that we just did. Um, so they'll get it a day or two ahead of time. Um, and you can join for as little as $2 a month. And it's very nice, and we appreciate it. And it's appreciated, yeah. that, that uh, We have a lot of fun doing this, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, not a but. We just do. It's nice to be appreciated, too. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. We will see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.